This is Prince Stanley coming to you today with 100,000 watts of pure love. The voice to Israel and for Israel. In the last podcast, we discussed how God draws Russia and Iran to attack Israel and why this battle will be different from the Battle of Armageddon. We discussed that Israel will be positioned into a force of prosperity and power, an international sign to the nations of the world. You might wonder how this will happen if you've been keeping up with the news this past week. P.M. Omer seems he is acting against Israel's national interest and is positioning Israel in great danger. The Syrian foreign minister has said that Prime Minister Omer agreed to cede the entire Golan and pull back to the pre-1967 war lines. Let me say right here, this is land that was not only won by the blood of Israelis, but was promised by God to Israelis. Omer is not of sufficient mental freedom at this time due to his own corruption scandal to negotiate anything of importance in Israel's name, especially a peace treaty with enemies and liars who will never keep a treaty. Hezbollah's armed militia now has a formal right to possess their own weapons arsenal. Plus, Syria is really not much worried about Israeli tanks anymore. They're now trying to purchase missile, air, and navy weapons to gain strategic superiority over Israel. Iskander E-missiles, MiG, G-29 SMT fighter bombers, and Amur-class submarines. And by the way, don't forget Syria and Iran both support Hezbollah and Hamas. But I have good news for you. A war between Israel and probably all of the Middle East will happen, not just bordering Arab states like Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. Remember we discussed in Isaiah, that's the prophet Ishawahu, chapter 11, verses 12 to 16 in the Tanakh, we read a description of a war that will happen before Mashiach comes to earth again the second time. The first 11 verses tell us about Messiah's return and his rule of peace on earth. But verses 12 through 16 cannot happen during this time because Messiah's reign is characterized by peace. Another distinctive feature of the prophecy in verses 12 through 16 of Isaiah chapter 11 is that the war therein described has not happened historically. It will happen. It is a future event and could happen right now. This position of prosperity and power will be part of the hook in the jaw that God uses to draw the powers from the north, Russia and her allies, to wage war against Israel. Israel will fly down upon the shoulder of the Palestinians, the Philistines, to the west. In context, Israel will strike against Egypt and Iraq. Ancient Assyria in the Bible is present-day Iraq and Syria. And Israel will plunder the people of the east. Israel will control these nations and evidently their wealth as a result of the plundering. Lexicographically, the people of the east include the Arab nations of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Kuwait, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and others. It is very evident here in this passage that Israel will control the east bank of Jordan, the ancient areas of Ammon, Moab, and Edom. This happened in Joshua's time and has not happened since the days of Isaiah. This is a future prophecy that will happen. The extreme wealth that Israel will control will be one of the things that God uses to draw the northern confederacy described in Ezekiel. You can see that in the Tanakh in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Notice it is God that draws the enemy from the north. Direction in the Bible is always from Yerushalayim, and God is going to draw Russia along with her allies, including Iran and others. God will put hooks in their jaw 
and lead them out with their armies to the mountains of Israel, brought back from people that have been gathered from the nations, from the Goyim. In addition to this extreme wealth that Israel will control, the thing that God uses to draw the northern confederacy described in the book of Ezekiel, I want to give you four other reasons that God might use to draw the northern powers at this present time, in this very day that we're living. other reasons that God might use to draw the northern powers at this present time, in this very day that we're living. Number one, Israel's present wealth, its people. Number two, Israel's scientific superiority. Number three, Israel's strategic geo-military positioning. And number four, Israel's previous victories over Islamic Arabic factions. Now, for details of each one of these four, consult my footnotes in the show notes of this podcast. But briefly, I will discuss, number one, Israel's present wealth, its people. In addition to the future wealth that Israel will control, as I described previously, there is also a present wealth of the potential in the people of Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu, in an interview with the Jerusalem Post on May 4th, 1998, said that wealth in the 21st century will be created by conceptual products. And I think Israel could be a very wealthy country, and I think that as the standard of living rises, it will begin to attract Jews from the West. Look at one of the wealthiest men in the world today, Bill Gates. Nobody can count his billions, but we do know, Netanyahu was speaking of the past 10 years, which is 20 years at the time in this podcast, that before that time, Bill Gates had close to zero. This is the greatest multiplication of wealth in history. What's true of individuals is true of nations. Netanyahu said those nations will thrive that have the ability to manipulate knowledge in every field of human endeavor. And I believe that we in Israel are very fortunate to have that kind of advantage. A second reason that I believe that God might use to draw the northern powers at this present time is Israel's scientific superiority. Israel has more scientists per capita than Switzerland. And a third reason that God might use to draw the northern powers at this pleasant time, Israel's strategic geo-military positioning. When I was younger, I enjoyed playing the game of Risk. It's a board game. It's a simulated military game where each opponent utilizes military forces in different geographic confines and then plans strategy from these same bases as well as from any new conquered land or positions. And I learned after several games of playing Risk that whenever I controlled Israel, I always won the game. And finally, a fourth reason that God might use to draw the northern powers, Russia, Iran, and her allies at this time against Israel, is Israel's previous victories over Islamic Arab factions. In the Yom Kippur War of 1973, most enemy aircraft survived these attacks, but IAF fighters still destroyed more than 450 enemy planes, mostly in dogfights. In fact, the IAF's air combat, their one loss record for 1973, was twice as good as it had been during the 1967 Six-Day War. And as a result, the enemy had to concentrate his sorties in defense of his own backyard. Of the few enemy planes which attacked inside Israel, not one succeeded in striking and returning. Now, you'll want to go to my show notes because you'll see in detail the four reasons that I believe are extra reasons God may draw Russia, Iran, and their allies to attack Israel at this very time. I've laid them out in detail. You can read them there. Also, I've given you nine footnotes where you can do further research on this subject. Now, I want to draw your attention to something I mentioned last time. And again, I'm not saying this will happen, but you need to realize that the battle described in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 could happen right now, at this very time. No other prophecies need to be fulfilled for this to happen. And the same goes for that battle described in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 12 to 16.
Now let me give you a commentary today. In the Torah, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 10, the Lord said, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. What Israel needs is a leader who will seek after the face of God, one who pays the price to know the will of God for Israel at each turn, a man that will earn the respect of Israelis. After Moses had spent many weeks in the presence of God, he came down to the camp and he found the people partying and worshiping the golden calf. You can read that in the Torah in Exodus chapter 32. Then Moses went back up to be with God for 40 days and nights, fasting, writing upon the tables the covenant, the Ten Commandments. During this time, he interceded with God for four things. Number one, that God would spare the children of Israel and not destroy them. Number two, that God would forgive the children of Israel for their sin and idolatry and their partying and worshiping the golden calf, even shortly after they were delivered from Egypt. Number three, that God would go before them with his presence on their journey. And number four, that God would allow Moshe the privilege of seeing his glory. Israel needs a selfless, a selfless leader who will pray and fast to break the powers of darkness that would destroy Israel at this time. There are many end-time prophecies that pertain to Israel. I mentioned some today in Isaiah chapter 11, in Ezekiel chapter 38, and chapter 39. However, in any generation, there are people called of God who are to pray, fast, and work hand-in-hand with God for the salvation of Israel. I trust you've enjoyed this series. You and I are living in the most exciting time we could ever want to live, the time for which God has prepared us from our mother's womb. Watch and pray. This is Prince Hanley coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure love. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai.